solar system became imperiled by some kind of event and they were driven to another sector of the galaxy and then later gravitated to our sector of the galaxy and ended up invading Earth. I think James um, Cameron's film Avatar is an exact reversal of Earth's history um, so that the Nakbe and Pandora are actually what happened to us. And the strange blue people, the Nakvi, were akin in appearance to those that actually invaded us. So it's actually a complete inversion of our Earth history, that film, cleverly done on his part. And it looks as if he offended his New World Order uh, handlers by making that film because he was dissed by the Hollywood uh, uh, establishment and the um, uh, the way he was treated the night of the Academy Awards with uh, mockery of his film um, and uh, the fact that it was largely overlooked for awards that night indicates that he had science on fiction a films post. have always been science fiction films have by and large always been overlooked by the Academy and not taken seriously by the Academy, except in the realm of special effects. So that comes as no huge surprise. What I, no, got I disagree. From I don't know. I don't think at all. Star Wars was lauded in all kinds of ways, so I don't accept that. But um, they weren't. But they weren't. But by and large, if you look at the catalog of science fiction films and when they actually started getting recognition from the Academy of Film Arts and Sciences, it wasn't based on the content. They were based on the technical achievements made to the technical achievements to actually make the movie. Not the content, not the story content. Just by and large it was what went into actually making the film. Well that that made now, as me far not... as Avatar as far as Avatar, yeah. what I took from that was basically, I mean, it's, a, it's an indictment of, it was an indictment of imperialism, and it's an illustration of our own history, uh, illustration of our own history here on Earth, and if you want to be specific, here within the United States. With well, there's that. There's, people there, coming there in, with that. people coming in, and driving the Native Americans off of their land so that they can exploit the resources there. And yeah, then exactly. what happens when the, when the Native element. people fight back? There's that element in it, no doubt. But it's a multi-layered film, as all great stories are. It's not just the telling of one mythos or one tale. It's multi-layered, and I do see Earth's uh, ancient history being retold in an inverse form. It's a clever ploy, and it was used by Shakespeare. For example, in Hamlet, he set the plot of Hamlet offshore in Holland when he was really referring to the English court. And since Norway is directly north of Denmark, it was a fitting reference to Scotland and the fact that succession would go to the Scottish king following the demise of the Tudor queen, that after her death she would be replaced on the throne by the monarch from the north. So it's a common ploy used in the arts to actually it's deflect telling the attention. Disguising the, the story. Yes, that's right. The size right. of the so, story is something else in order to be able to get it told without censure. I mean, exactly. Star, Star Trek, the original Star Trek was great for that because basically what, if you, by and large, what a lot of the episodes in the original Star Trek were, were morality plays, and they were addressing issues of the time that because of network, political and network censure could not be addressed directly any other way. So if they were able to disguise that in 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 science fiction, it would make it palatable because the censors wouldn't know what to look for. But people watching the show 
anyone of reasonable intelligence watching the show and who had any kind of awareness of what was going on in the world, they would pick up on what was being presented to them. That's right. So you're, you're right about it being a film about imperialism, but I also think he was telling our uh, Earth history in an inverted form so as to disguise his intention so that he couldn't be subject to uh, direct attack. Um, one needs to do it because I don't think people realize, and as a writer myself who's been subject to persecution and resistance my entire career on a scale that I don't even think you could uh, imagine. Um, it, it, it's apparent to me that you have to do it. You have to disguise what your intentions and what your work are actually trying to do because you're under a constant attack and in danger of your is in danger. You could either be assassinated or attempts can be made to destroy you or your career. Uh, you, they, they use all kinds of ways and means to destroy people that pose a threat to them. Um, in my case, they went after my career and uh, made all kinds of attempts to discredit. Um, and having done that, I'm, in a way, advantaged insofar as they can't then kill someone that they've spent uh, a good many years discrediting because then you would just grant validity to what that person's work uh, was all about by then killing them. So I understand the danger that he's in and I understand exactly why Stanley Kubrick disguised his um, references to the New World Order and the all-seeing eye cult with uh, subtle little frames in his films and made all kinds of disguised references to the occult in his films because if he did it overtly, he would have uh, been murdered at a much earlier stage in his career. And there is a strong contention and speculation that he was actually murdered, um, not uh, that he didn't die of natural causes. Well, a lot of people... Yeah, sorry, Corey, I was just going to say, we normally have an ads break um, round about now, and we have got a caller on the line later on that might ask a question, um, but they're quite happy to sit there for now. It's one of our... Um, of a host, so just going to play um, two or three minute of ad breaks and then back back then carrying on. Five, four, three, two, one. This is freedomtalkradio.net, and you are listening to Freedom. <laughs> Talk Radio. My beautiful Celine in southeastern Michigan. Around the world. This is the 2009 Top 10 Webcam in the World winner. This is SETV. Thank you for listening to the Freedom Talk Radio Network and the Truth Police with your host, Andy Peacher, and author, Timothy Spearman. Live from Grimsby in the UK and Toronto in Canada every Saturday at 5 p.m. UK time and 12 noon Eastern Standard Time in the USA and Canada. Call into the show when the phone lines are open. UK calling number 0131 618 Seven double seven eight, and from the USA and Canada, call three one five four six two four one hundred. Visit the station's website on www.freedomtalkradio.co.uk, and author Timothy Spearman's website www.shakespeare.com. That's www.shakespeare.com. Look at Tim's recent books, Odds on Favourites and Butterfly Dreams, found on the homepage and the books tag.
Yeah, welcome back, back to The Truth, please, with Andy and Tim. Um, we're simultaneously broadcasting over Spreaker at the same time um, from our website, which is www.freedomtalkradio.co.uk or freedomtalkradio.net. Um, uh, technology's moving on a little bit today. We've got actor, writer, um, playwright, I guess, Corey Williams, um, some of your films, I'm just going to change the subject for a little while. Um, some of your films you've done, uh, Corey, is A Day of Atonement, Fight and Words, Survival of the Fattest, Let's Talk, Twelve Monkeys, and so on. Um, is it easy to be an actor um, these days in L.A.? I mean, that was one of my questions. Um, also, um, I'm fascinated about the Star Trek because I want to be one of them people that they beam me up and get me out of here. I just wish that was real. Well, as far as, as far as, is it easy to be an actor? Not necessarily. It's, it's not a life for everyone. If you have the ability then you have to find ways to nurture and hone that ability. So then it becomes a matter of taking that and training yourself, taking classes, doing what you need to hone and sharpen the ability. And then, even once you've done that, making the kind of connections that you need to make in order to further your career. Now, an agent, a manager... The agent is the person who would help you actually find the work. A manager would be the person who helps you steer your career in the direction where you want to go. Both of these things are necessary. And then, I mean, fostering networking, being able to foster connections through networking is also very important. A lot of times it's being in the right place at the right time. There's so many things involved. Also, being, especially if you are an actor of color, trying to jump a number of hurdles, being, being, being a woman, being an actor of color, what have you, there are all kinds of hurdles that you have to be able to get past because there is still racism in the business. There's sexism, ageism, nepotism. All of these things exist. So being able to get around all of that to deal with, to get quality roles, being able to get, all, get around and navigate the politics involved simply so that you can get work, it's, again, it's not a life for everybody. And there is, among relatively new actors, there's a reasonably high rate of attrition where people come in, with the with stars in their eyes and thinking they're going to make it, and for every one that for every one that does make it, there are dozens, if not hundreds, who don't, because of the barriers that you have to deal with from day to day, the simple the simple existence barriers. I mean, while you're busy trying to get acting work, finding a means to keep a roof over your head, clothes on your back, food in your belly, and the money that you need in order to continue your training. All of these things are they're paramount in order for you to get anywhere in the business. And it's just, like I said, it's, at the risk of repeating myself, it's not the kind of existence for everybody. It's a big gamble. It's a big gamble, just sending the headshots, trying to get work, going to the auditions, and you're basically playing roulette, doing all of these things in the hopes that you will get the job. When the job comes, it's great. If you get steady work, so much the better. But it's not easy. Yeah, no, I suppose that's a bit like a writer. Um, a writer, you know, he's got this perfect book. He's um, even got somebody to publish it, but if the book's not selling, you know, I mean, is it the author's fault? Is it, um, 
you know, is it lack of marketing? Is it people just not interested in, in whatever book that is? And I guess it's the same with films. You have a film crew, perfect actors, you know, all ready to go, perfect film, but, you know, the, the people who, who sell these films say, no, not this time. So it's very difficult, I guess. Yeah, marketing is a big issue, whether you're a writer or an actor. Marketing is a big issue. Um, being able to get your product out in the public eye and being able to get that product out in the public eye loudly and clearly enough to drum up the kind of attention that you want, to drum up the kind of sales that you want, it's it's not easy. So be, it, be you a writer or an artist, be you a, an artist of any kind, it's not the easiest of existences. And being a writer, being an actor, being a filmmaker, all this is it. It's a, write, for example, marketing your writing is like producing the work in and of itself, which involves writing and then rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and editing and rewriting. That's one thing. But then once you've finally gotten the product out there, once, you, once you've gotten it done and getting it in the hands of a publisher who's willing to take a chance, especially if you're an unknown, like I was, like, that's... I mean, that's nerve-wracking in and of itself. They take the chance, and then the book is out there, then becomes a matter of marketing. If they have their own in-house machinery that's designed to do that, so much the better, even while you still need to do some of that yourself. And I've been doing a lot of this myself. And the whole marketing process can be like herding cats. So it's not easy, and it's really a matter of diligence and perseverance. Yeah, in some cases, getting somebody to help you um, with no expectations of any big percentage, which which um, probably is a way for some, um, you know, writers and actors. Uh, yeah, so we've got an old friend on the line, actually. Um, well, he's not an old friend. Um, yeah. he's, an, <laughs> he's not that old. He's a, he's a friend of the station and host, um, and he's interviewed you recently on the uh, last year, Surrounded by Idiots. Um, we've and got Bill Zem on the line. Just oh, want Bill, to say hello to Corey. Corey Williams, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I am not bad. Believe it or not, I am uh, in with this uh, um, ship of uh, fine gentlemen that uh, you're talking to today, and um, I'm doing the simulcast on Spreaker to uh, get you on two different networks at the same time. So how have you been doing? Wow. Um, I'm doing good. Working hard, always looking for more, as usual. Uh, like I said, now four books out, and trying to get the word out as much as possible. And uh, between that and trying to get acting work, and we're more or less in holiday hiatus, so things have slowed down right now. But I have been, I have gotten some work, so things are, things, I'm looking forward to things really picking up in this new year. Well, that, that's good. I am. Uh, I'm very happy for you. I've been uh, following you since you were on the show, and I am uh, now that I know that you got another couple of books out. I'm going to purchase those books and uh, start reading them. And I'm sure they're at least as good as the first two books because those those two were fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> like I said, it's 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 the work is constant, and my head is full of stuff that just needs to come out. So, like, number five will, hopefully in another year or so, number five will be out, too. Well, that's good. Are you still doing your own um, artwork for the books? I am at this point. I'm also looking into different types of, different types of software, you know, computer software, to do illustration that, that way, as opposed to by hand, to try to make some, some of the images a more photorealistic, shall we say? Right. Because what I've been doing now is all hand-drawn. Yeah, but they're very good. I mean, it shows uh, your, uh, not only your talent as a writer, but your, your love for the subjects that you're doing and, 
and uh, characters in the book. It's funny because when back in in earlier days, there was Wayne Douglas Barlow had talked about this because he is now well known, incredibly famous illustrator. He's done book covers, he's done production design for films, and that type of thing. And one of the things that had been mentioned was in in one of his books, Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, is that a lot of people thought that artists were dumb because when you look at the covers of a lot of the books, the cover designs don't look anything like the way, the, the way, for example, your aliens were described in the story itself. When it comes down to it, it's not a matter of the artist being dumb. It's the fact that they had a deadline and they were given practically no information to work with. They are given a very sketchy amount of information to work with. And they did what they could with what they had. And the fact that what they, were, that what they created and what was allowed to pass didn't jive with what was in the book, I think is more the fault, not so much the artist, but more the fault of the editor and publisher for not giving them more to work with. So that's why he created his book, whereas he read hundreds of books and picked the most imaginative, the most imaginative, imaginative but biologically realistic um, aliens and did these fantastic, almost photorealistic paintings of these things. And that was an inspiration. She was definitely an inspiration as an artist. I'm still working on getting that point. But being at least having the wherewithal at this point to hand draw my, my book covers is, is just something I love doing. Now I'm just working on making, just refining the technique and making the images more realistic and that's why I'm looking into various different illustrator programs that can help me do that no. but yeah the, the love for the work to be able to, to, to sit down and do that yourself besides the fact I know what what's in the book and I know what I, I know what I wrote so I know what I want it to look like so it's that much easier if I can do it I might as well do it myself now, let me ask you a question. Does um, the fact that you illustrate the covers for your own books, is that helping you out in um, getting your foot in the door for acting jobs? That they know that you are a multi-talented person, not only an actor, but you're an artist and a writer? For acting jobs, not necessarily. Because it's that's not what they're looking for, <laughs> really. If when When you go to various different sites, for example, when you go to actor sites and they will for for promoting yourself, and then they'll have this long questionnaire of various different talents that can they're looking for talents that can be used on stage, on screen, in front of the camera, what have you. If there are things that you can add to that, great. But they have a whole list of various different types of things that you have to take off. Most, if not all of which, are very physical. So the type of stuff that I do as far as my writing, my, my artwork and what have you, that would not necessarily come into play there unless a role specifically asked for, if the, the casting were, were looking specifically for someone who happened to an actor who also happened to be an artist or have some kind of artistic ability. But that doesn't happen very often. So it's when they're looking at the resume, they're looking for and they're looking primarily for what you can do as an actor, what you what kind of talents physically that you can do in front of the camera. Like can you can you ride a motorcycle? Can you play football? Can you play basketball? That type of thing. Hmm. So as a writer and artist, that doesn't really make much of a difference as far as being an actor goes. So you could, um, I would imagine, probably, I would, I would think that it would open up uh, certain roles, like role, um, uh, movies about writers, artists, that sort of thing. Uh, kind of a kind of a niche thing and typecasting, but I would think that that would uh, that would help out in that regard. And if again, if that is something specifically that the producer and the casting people are looking for, 
and then that's the type of thing that they would come to you directly. But, I mean, a lot of times for films, say, a film about a particular artist, they will usually have, they'll cast an actor to play the role, but they'll have a production, one of their production designers or what have you to actually do the artwork that they will to create, to physically create the artwork that's then shown on the, shown on the screen and then within the script it's stated that okay this person did this so you have the act you have the actor portraying the role and then you have the production designer and the production artist actually creating the the visual work itself hmm. so it's not very often that you'll come across the type of that type of thing unless it's like a small independent film where you can use an actor who happens to be an artist and you can use their work doesn't happen very often. Oh, that's the business that, is funny that way. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I would imagine so. It uh, it's uh, very interesting that you're that you're doing so well. I just wanted to uh, jump in and um, say hi to you and see how you're doing and everything. I came into the show a little bit late. We've had uh, a lot of in-house server issues here at the uh, SCTV oh. headquarters, and I've actually just got them back up online. Uh, around 1 o'clock this afternoon, so I jumped into the simulcast and figured I'd uh, give the microphone a test, too. So I'm going to hand you back over to Tim and Andy and uh, put myself on hold, guys, and you guys are back on. Corey, it was very, very nice talking to you again, and um, I will. Uh, I think I've got your email around somewhere. I'll give you a uh, shout in a few weeks, and uh, maybe we can get together and uh, get you on the show and do a review of your books. All right, thank you. Great. Yeah, not a problem. And here is Tim. Very careful of you. Yep, and here is Tim and Andy again. Bye, Corey. Oh. <laughs> you later. We're back. We're back. <laughs> so one of your films um, in television you worked on, um, I think this is the one I, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I've seen it around our Sky Television Network where they repeat all the American television programs, uh, mostly true stories of I've heard that in Lords of the Mafia what, what did you oh, actually wow. play in them films well they were among the first among the first jobs that I got when I moved out to Los Angeles uh, Lords of the Mafia that was made for for public broadcast the public broadcasting system out here and it basically each episode spotlighted a particular figure, a prominent figure in organized crime, and the episodes that I did were about a man named Lester Lloyd Coke, who also went by the, went by the pseudonym Jim Brown, and he was the head of the Shower Posse, which was a particularly violent organized crime group based out of, out of Jamaica who had made serious inroads and did a lot of damage in the in the United States back during the 1980s. So apparently, he said, I, out of the actors who showed up and auditioned for the part, one, I seemed to capture him because, I, I, and I looked more like him. So they went with that. They went with that. And so that was actually that was actually interesting because they had we had various different we had a montage of various different scenes of him working with his various underlings and the perpetra the perpetration of certain crimes and then there was the when he was in prison he was in prison in Jamaica and being interviewed by his lawyer so that we shot that whole thing where he's having the conversation with his lawyer because US Marshals are coming to extradite him to the United States to basically to go on trial for crimes that the shower posse had committed in the United States now that that didn't come to pass because right before the the U.S. Marshals arrived, he had been immolated in his, in his jail cell, because apparently he was working for 
the then president of of Jamaica, Siaga, and so he had political connections. But when he when he proved to be a liability rather than an asset, Siaga turned his back on him. And so when he saw that happen, he was going to turn when he was going to trial in the states. He was going to turn states' evidence, and he was basically going to drop the bomb on Siaga and let the whole world know about political corruption within Jamaica and his part in it. And so, basically, he was murdered before he could say anything. So we did that with mostly true stories, which has been airing, which had been airing here on the Learning Channel. What they did was it was recreations of various different urban legends, and I did three of them. Yeah, I did about three of them. We recreated various different urban legends and then went into whether or not these things actually happened. One of them was a, we had a, I was a cop, and we arrested a man who was part of a, a group of guys who were perpetrating robberies. And so we had him, but we wanted him to dime out the rest of his group so we could take them all down. And the only way to do that would be with a lie detector, which they didn't have access to at the time. So what they did, and, and this criminal they had was not definitely not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So what they did was they took a colander, a spaghetti strainer, strapped it to his head and wired it to a photocopier. And they had a piece of paper on the face of the photocopier that simply said, he's lying. And every time they asked him a question and he gave them an answer that they didn't believe, someone would press the button and this machine would spit out a piece of paper saying, he's lying. And they did this often enough, over and over and over again, during the course of the interrogation until the guy had finally cracked and gave them the information they needed. Now, this supposedly had actually happened in, in New Hope, Pennsylvania in the early 70s. So that was an urban legend that, is, as it turned out, was true. So that was that's what that whole show was about, just presenting dramatizations of urban legends and then either debunking them or demonstrating that, you no, know, these things actually happened. Yeah. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. Um, have you got any questions, Tim? Um, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to think of where to go next with the, the interview. Um, I guess the uh, question is, if you had an ideal um, film to play a part in or um, an ideal project that came along, what would it be? An ideal project, I would say, would be one of my own. <laughs> the, the, the an absolute ideal project would be one of my own. Um, I would, I'm, would love to see one of my own projects realized. Matter of fact, one of my scripts that again is in the hands of investors right now. It's, it's, they're kind of sitting on it right now, but they have it. And so, I mean, we're going round and round with that. But to be able to see one of my own projects realized, at least one, there's Pathfinder, which is basically, it's a science fiction film that's a black box drama, so you have a small cast and limited location, which would make it easier to shoot. The Taking of Sidriel's Hope, which was an adaptation of my book, then that is much larger, and, and there's a lot more action involved with that. Hunter's Moon, I have actually scripted out as a miniseries because the book itself is so long and so involved that the best way to be able to capture that and present as much information to the public as possible would be a miniseries, which there I would like to go with sci-fi, with the sci-fi channel and various different, various different entities along, broadcast entities along those lines to get it out there. So, again, the the perfect project for me would be to be able to act in something that I've written. Yep, and um, so 
Andy, what's your next question? Well, I think I'm running out of questions. <laughs> Apart from, I would, I would really love, you know, the beam me up, Scotty. Um, I'd love to be vanished from Earth to planet somewhere, nice land, and spend a few weeks up there getting to know normal things. And But, it, again, it may just be fantasy, so I might as well just carry on with my dreaming. <laughs> Well, teleportation is on the horizon. The, the technology is on the horizon. We've, they've, scientists have actually been able to at least teleport, teleport a subatomic particle from one area to another. Getting to the point where we can do it with a living being, with even a single-celled organism, is that's that's quite a ways off. Let alone a complex organism, complex organism like ourselves. And it's been speculated with computer technology being what it is now, in order to transport, in order to teleport one person, the amount of information about every atom in that person's body that you would need in order to faithfully send all of that elsewhere and reconstruct it in its original pattern, you would basically need... 500 hard drives, each one the size of the Empire State Building. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> but as as computers technology becomes becomes more and more powerful, and that's happening all the time, there will there there may there will eventually come a time where teleportation will actually will actually happen. It's, I doubt seriously that it will ever be in our lifetimes, but just the fact that science fiction has created the inspiration to make scientists want to actually make this reality, that is going to happen. It was an interesting interview uh, with Kate Mulgrew, who played Captain um, Jane Way on Star Trek Voyager, and she had said that you don't normally see, say, doctors who will watch shows like ER or Chicago Hope or various different television shows that deal with doctors. You don't come across very many lawyers who were watching shows like L.A. Law or what have you, shows that dealt with lawyers. However, in her experience, practically every scientist she has ever spoken to grew up watching Star Trek. So, that tells you that science fiction fires the imagination and makes people want to make that type of thing a reality. So, it's, it's coming. It is coming. Maybe not in our lifetime, but it is coming. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm sure when I was um, in my young days, in the early 70s, I'm pretty certain that somebody told me um, on a TV program, that um, someday you will be able to have a telephone that you don't need to plug in, and the microwave, you know, <laughs> that you just push in, you know, push your food in, press a button, and you'll get hot food. Um, I'm pretty certain in the 70s I've seen them on TV, and of course in the 80s they all came out. Really, yeah, you, you know. Don't. I mean, Sid Mead basically said, the futurist artist Sid Mead said that science fiction is basically science fact ahead of schedule. So Yeah, um, I just re I've just read somewhere, falling on to a different category now. Yeah, I, 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 I probably agree with that. Most of it is science fact. Um, you're, are you a bounty hunter? I just read it somewhere. Um, where does that come into your career? No, 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 no. I had done no. a I had done a web um, um, web series. It was a mini series um, called Han Shot First, in which I played a bounty hunter. Yeah, I played a, I played a bounty hunter. Um, it was, I and my friend Hazel. We played a pair of bounty hunters who happened to be big fans of science fiction. So the, that was the running joke. There was. You had these two people who very different from one another, but shared a very. They were, both had a love for science fiction, 
both very much nerds that way, but had this had this occupation where they were bounty hunters. So yeah, that was just for that just for that program, which was a lot of fun this year. Brilliant. But, um, we're kind of running out of time because we've got a couple of things to mention. Um, the, the news, we've, we've got about 30 minutes, um, and there's a bit of record time as well. So do you want to put out all your books again, where you get them from, any website, any email address you want to give? Um... Okay. Well, the books are Totentanz, T-O-T-E-N-T-A-N-Z, The Taking of Sindriel's Hope, Hunter's Moon, and Dark Speed Aradani, all of which are available through lulu.com. That's my publisher's website, lulu.com. They're also available through Amazon. And I can be reached through, well, my own website is Cory is Corey Works. It's Corey.lifestreamcenter.net. And I'm also, I can also be contacted through my Facebook page. And it's I have two two Facebook pages. One is Corey Williams, and the other is Corey Works. And I do either of them. That's brilliant, Corey. Um, you're an amazing person. You've done a lot of acting, a lot of writing, and a lot of art and drama in your life. Um, it was very brilliant to talk to you, and um, hope you have a brilliant day. Thank you. You too. Um, if you want a copy of the MP3, um, we'll gladly send it, my friend. Oh, please, yes. Okay, then. We'll, I'm just going to play a promo, Tim, and then we'll get on with some news. Okay. All right. Thanks for having me. FreedomSoftRadio.co.uk This is the most diverse most amazing, one of the funniest radio stations you can ever listen to on the internet. I've heard so much stuff from the ups, the downs, the left, the right, the politics, the non-politics, the smaller kids, whatever you want to call them, it's great. Yeah, welcome back to Truth, Please with Andy Peter and author Timothy Spearman. Um... I've been reading today um, the west coast of the USA. They don't want anybody to eat the fish um, because the Fukushima plant is just sending it loads of poisons, um, which is very sad. And and a little bit that I don't like as well, the people in Michigan, I don't know who they will be, but they're sending us some snow to the UK next week. Um, and apparently we're getting minus 25 over in the UK with um, heavy bursts of snow. So please, Detroit, keep your snow next time because we don't like it. <laughs> Tim, you got any stories to tell us? I I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, on the theme, um, there's this uh, site, S-E-P-I News, um, E-C-E-T-I, with James Gilliland, um, he's an interesting fella. Um, I like him because he's very humble and um, he doesn't grandstand and try to draw any particular attention himself. He's um, got this new age philosophy of wanting to share. And um, so that's where I'm at. Um, this is the way I am. I try to share, and I don't like doing things by myself. That's why I join hands with you, <laughs> and that's why I had um, an interest in Maggie because I love people, um, especially good-hearted people that have a, an attitude of wanting to share. So. One of the problems that I've had with artists over the years, Andy, is that a lot of them are too much about me. <laughs> and they tend to want a lot of attention uh, foisted on them. And uh, I just love sharing. 
So to do something as a collective effort and to draw other people and their talents and abilities into the project and make it all inclusive, that's to me a more um, worthy endeavor because there everyone feels a sense of worth and a sense of being valued. And uh, You had a little bad luck uh, where Orion radio didn't recognize your talents and I did and um, so I made the suggestion that we you know team up and try to uh, do something together and um, whereas the previous host that you were co-hosting with um, he was all about him all about ego all about me <laughs> and you know uh, I think he had some kind of view that you weren't as much in the know on topics uh, that interested him and he felt that he was the greater mm, intellect or the greater expert or whatever and uh, to me none of that matters to me, what matters is that you recognize the gifts in everyone and you draw them forth. So, you know, Socrates, uh, he was um, always depicting himself or representing himself as the midwife of knowledge. And so he brought out the knowledge in others through his effort to communicate. So... He knew that everyone had wisdom inside them that just needed to be drawn out. And that's why I like James Gilliland, because he's a very benevolent, gentle, um, very, very uh, soft-spoken and mild-mannered man, nice American gentleman. He has his own little ranch, and uh, he's claiming to be in contact with um, various extraterrestrial civilizations. And, um, well, I find him credible and I find him convincing. And I don't think he's grandstanding, nor do I think he's trying to draw any attention to himself. He seems as gentle as a lamb, and I like him. Anyway, he's got his happy new year. May you be blessed with chaos address. And uh, I'm just going to read a little bit uh, from it, if that's okay with you, Andy. Absolutely. You go ahead. Before you get confused as to whether this is a blessing, let me explain. When you are engaging higher consciousness and energy and rising up the vibrational continuum, chaos comes with the territory. Those who understand semantics know when you introduce high frequency sound to sound patterns, it disrupts the previous pattern which goes into chaos, then reforms into a new, more intricate, evolved pattern. This is what humanity and the earth is going through. All the ancients foretold about these times, and it is cyclic, natural, and the forces are cosmic in cause. Little hint about global warming. All the planets are going through transition, atmospheric changes, and they don't have cars on Mars. I've always been a strong supporter of fuelless energy, yet this problem, climate change, is much bigger than auto emissions. Uh, many ask what is going to happen in 2014. My answer is chaos. How much chaos depends on our decisions and individually and collectively how much we resist change. There are two people, well, there are two things people resist and fear the most, change and the unknown. Change is coming and the unknown is going to be made known. All that which was suppressed, covered up, held back is going to come forward. The power elite, the banksters, the puppet governments, and their agencies are going to be real busy cleaning up the mess, doing damage control as their dubious deeds rise to the surface. It is like a black kettle of smelly fish boiling over as the energy increases. The fuelless energy alternative cures and the exposure of those who suppress them will come forward as well. The lamestream media will eventually come to the realization the masses are waking up no longer listening, and they have lost all credibility. 
Ever wonder why they're trying to give away newspapers? Subscriptions are in the toilet. People are turning off their TVs and going to alternative news for the truth. This is bad for business, and we all know money talks. Advertisers pay according to ratings, so they're doomed to eventually tell the truth, and it will be sensational. The mainstream news came out to film Debunk. The ships, they were in awe when the ships appeared. I debunked the Nassau and government debunkers before they even started telling them we were using your data to prove these are not space shuttles, space stations, satellites, or known man-made objects. They referred to objects landing on Mount Adams, morphing into three objects, and then leaving with jets chasing them as the space shuttle? Official them at its best. Now, who is looking ridiculous? The UFO topic took their ratings to a record-breaking high, which the advertisers love. So we'll end the cover-up because covering UFOs will be driven by profit. ABC, Fox News, History Channel, Paranormal State, Danny Dyer Special, and other coverages are all on the site, aseti.org. Breakthroughs in alternative energy and healing technology will soon follow, not just through alternative media, but eventually in the mainstream, too. So it looks like change is on the horizon, my friend. It also looks like it's going to be a pretty uh, heavy and hectic and chaotic year ahead, but um, I think we've got to look for solid ground and dig our feet in. What do you say? Yeah, well, I had this dream that 2014 added up to make 7, whichever way you want to do it, um, or 14, two sevens are 14, 2 and 7. All that stuff was good news, but the year started off terrible. Oh, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, your, your stuff and my stuff all together, you know, before Christmas... We thought we was just running so fast out of the way of all our personal um, and, you know, our work problems. But it's all, all of a sudden hit us in two weeks. And um, they always say that what don't hurt you makes you stronger or something like that. Um, or what hurts you makes you stronger, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Anyway, um, so I think we're being tested to make us stronger, to make us succeed. But maybe January is not a good month. Maybe being a Capricorn in the early Januarys and, and it's the first of the 14, which is 15 in numbers. Maybe it's not, not the right time yet. Hopefully by February, things will calm down. Well, I find what's happening is what James described in that opening blurb, he said, um, when you're engaging higher consciousness and energy and rising up the vibrational continuum, chaos comes with the territory. In other words, if you're on the verge of gaining enlightenment, um, you're going to be um, faced with various um, demons that are going to try to hold you back. Um, the Buddha confronted... Um, certain obstacles just before he achieved enlightenment. Um, and Jesus, we will experience something similar when he was doing his fast in the wilderness and became haunted by various demonic specters and um, was presented with various challenges as he approached that higher plane of enlightenment. So... I think in part that's what's happening, but on the other hand, there's a, like he describes in this next sentence, there's something like this going on too. Those who understand semantics know when you introduce high frequency sound to sand patterns, it disrupts the previous pattern which goes into chaos and then reforms into a new, more intricate evolved pattern. Now, I remember reading Greg Braden's book, Andy, and uh, Greg Braden talked about how we were going from 8 hertz 
of vibration of you know frequency uh, eight hertz frequency on this planet to 13 hertz and he said that because of the current eight hertz of uh, frequency that the planet is under it causes patterns in configurations of seven like for example you'll find that um, the veins and arteries and capillaries in your body branch into um, seven branches as they make their way through the body if you look at the root systems and the branch systems on trees and uh, plant life you find that the branches and fork into configurations of seven when you look at uh, the lightning that um, seems to strike uh, at various times during storms you'll find that it also branches into um, configurations of seven so um, what uh, Greg Braden claims is that as the frequency um, goes up and it currently apparently is ramping up considerably going from 8 Hertz to 13 Hertz frequency of vibration then the uh, configurations of um, uh, these the configurations that I've just described become more intricate, far more intricate and crystalline in nature. So our DNA is uh, becoming more intricate and uh, new codons in the DNA are actually switching on. Um, we have 64 codons in our DNA and, and UCLA undertook a study that showed that an extra two codons had actually been switched on in our DNA um, and uh, we're becoming more light being uh, in our makeup um, less dense and carbon based in our um, you know structure and our DNA is changing from a carbon based DNA into a crystalline DNA so it's claimed and so um, the planet is also becoming less dense. Apparently, it's going to become luminous and eventually translucent. Um, the planet or the mother Earth that we live on. Um, so, what for change? Uh, we're headed for change by the looks of it. And uh, what seems to be chaos really is a realignment and a reconfiguration. And we just have to learn to go with the flow, I think, Andy. Yeah, we certainly have to. Well, you remember when your mom took you for a walk, shopping, or down the street, or down the sidewalk, and you grabbed on to her hand, or you grabbed hold of her skirt or her dress. Uh, we have to do that with our Mother Earth, Andy. We've got to just hang on. Yeah, I was thinking, <laughs> I was picturing that in my head, and I'm thinking, we'd better hang on before we fall off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a merry ride. It's going to be like one of those roller coaster rides at the fair. I mean, this sort of new story I've got here, um, I mentioned it earlier a little bit. It's not going to help at all, is it? Fukushima again. Um, over 130 potentially radioactive cars from Japan's nuclear disaster site Fukushima have been banned from entering Russia. Russia's consumer watchdog was concerned about contaminated water from the power plant on the cars, basically. Uh, they're coming as cargo on ships, and they turned them back. So then we've got the west coast of the U.S. saying no fish. I mean, global warming, you know. I mean, in the 70s, it was hot in the summer in the U.K., and it was cold in the winter, kind of normal. Now it's, I mean, last year it was snowing in May um, in the UK, and it was early 70 degrees in the winter with only one outburst of snow, which was late February, sorry, two, late February and May. So is it, is it really global warming? Is there something really um, 
else going on. And apparently TEPCO is to siphon off the radioactive water from the tunnels leading to the Fukushima plant. I mean, I'm not being funny to them. Why don't they just close it down, put a little match to it, and hopefully nobody will get injured and that will be the end of that disaster for good. Because at the moment, it, it being there is causing mass problems around the world. That's only my opinion, of course. I I, I know what you mean. It's, you know, um, if you had a piece of paper and you were cutting a corner off the piece of paper and you were trying to shape the paper and so on, uh, we used to do that when we were kids. It's a shame they can't do that with that little corner of Japan and just you know, get the scissors out and cut it off and let it sink into the ocean, you know? It's, um, we've got to snuff out the candle, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, news in from Maggie earlier on today. Um, oh, where's it gone now? I've lost it, but... Uh, do, 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 that one, yeah. No, not that one. Maggie, 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 why? Yeah. The former Home Secretary, um, Liam Britton, um, is a paedophile in a seized video by Scotland Yard. So, ex toy cabinet minister caught on camera at a child sex party. Um, and the rumours are circulating in London pubs frequented by journalists that the ex minister accused of abusing children and the person in the video seized by. Please, it's a. You got okay. Andy, you just got sorry. cut off. You're gonna have to repeat that. Oh, sorry. Um, ex toy cabinet minister at a sex child party, a child sex party. Sorry, the rumours circulating in London pubs frequent, frequented by journalists that the ex minister accused of abusing children and the person in the video seized by the Met, Met Police in London is a former Home Secretary. Not so long ago, Leon Britton, the mainstream press have known his identity for some time and the rest may now be imminent. Britton served in Prime Minister Thatcher's time, government during the 80s, um, also later on. She seems to have surrounded herself with paedophiles. All members of a very powerful paedophile ring operated from within our government. Most members of that ring have yet to be exposed. However, the blog called the Duck Shoot blog has seen the list. No wonder she wept when they sacked her. She ignored the crimes of Edward Heath, the preceding Prime Minister, and various other members of her government. Uh, Liam Britton became Home Secretary June 83, soon after he came under pressure to ban the paedophile information exchange, um, which campaigned for the age of consent reduced to four years old. In other words, they wanted to legalize paedophilia. Um, yeah, basically, to age consent of four years old. Imagine a four-year-old. Anyway, it doesn't bear thinking about. Pi had over a thousand members in the early 80s. These people were prominent and powerful, and they're part of the British government and the establishment. Britain ignored the pressure and created a policy which actually protected the paedophiles, encouraged their infiltration into schools and children's homes. Uh, the Met Police are now holding video evidence of a paedophile sex party in London. On the video is a former cabinet minister who has not been named by police, but we know who he is. Charges are going to be later later on. So Leon Britton, they're thinking that's him. Um, it's very shocking because not only did they want to legalise um, sex um, to, at four years of age, uh, when they can't get it, that way they're doing it a different way now tim they want the schools and the education system to take over over here and say look you know four or five year olds learn about the birds and the bees and and the sex and all that so the children whether they you know try and ignore things or not whether it's education whether it's social services whether it's um whichever way they look the poor children are being taught to learn about sexual 
acts um, which they shouldn't even be thinking about learning, um, not even the knowledge of them until at least probably the the teens, you know, the early teens, the 12 and 13-year-olds. But four and five-year-olds, this country is disgusting, Tim. Yeah, unfortunately it is, Andy. It is disgusting. Um, and Canada and uh, the United States and many other countries uh, share the same disgusting practices because there's just simply too many Satanists um, <laughs> running the show. Um, when I think about the history of England and the extreme cruelty that the population has been subject to for centuries, uh, I realize that you have been under the control of satanic bloodline families since your origin, basically since your beginnings, and um, that problem has been exported to all of your colonies, your former colonies, um, and it's basically gone worldwide, and um, other empires that have exported the same um, problems, like the Khazarian Empire, which uh, has infiltrated... Um, uh, so so much of our power structure around the world, you know? Yeah, yeah one day we'll, we'll get peace. And I always said to, to people who are having problems, you'll get peace and, and you know, what's the word? Um, you know, you won't be under the regime anymore, but the only time you'll get that peace is when you're dead but then you don't really experience a peace because you don't know what's happening. So it's really, it's really sad, isn't it, that... Uh, how old, is it just happening now, all this stuff, you know? I mean, did it happen in the 10th century, the 11th, 12th? Um, has it been this bad on Earth? Or, or are we only experiencing now because times are coming to, to the end times? Oh, let's face it, Andy. I mean, for you to live in England during the feudal period as a serf or um, a worker of the fields, uh, that would have been the worst kind of life you could possibly imagine. Or even being a knight in those days with the, the horror of the battlefield and um, or being... Um, relegated to fighting the Spanish Armada or um, being on a merchant marine type ship um, being a pirate as they called it which means in <laughs> piratis, agents of fire um, basically y you couldn't not expect to be attacked on the seas and have to fend off a foe at sea and so uh, when we think about pirates with their um, game legs and their peg legs and their eye patches and their facial scars and their um, hook, like Captain Hook, you know, with the hook hand and having a hand that's a hook, uh, I mean, uh, those were perilous times, my friend. Their cruelty, those men... Uh, we're subject to is far worse than any cruelty we've had to endure, I'm sure. Oh, yes, me lad. Oh, yes, me lad. I kind of believe you there. Yeah. You know? I yep. really... <laughs> I think we moan about how hard done by we are, but in reality, we, we're probably not doing that, that so bad, are we? We're not doing so bad, even. I was just having a quick look to let everybody know what's going on next week. Um, and on Saturday, we've got George Sheld. Um, George Sheld, or Sheld, S-C-H-E-L-D, is considered one of the most experienced and accomplished private investigators in New York State. George is among a small group of personal investigators across the nation is agreed into industry with a legal background and additional expertise in claims and insurance fraud. He's very good at detective um, work, PI work. Um, he's also uh, got uh, a BS in history. 
university with a is it bachelor's of science in history. His grad, grad, blah, graduate degree came from Adelphi University. He, he's um, a very good good guy. I had a quick chat with him. Um, I think there's more to what what he's talking about than the PI stuff, but it's very linked into what you know, um, and that's why I invited him on as a guest. Uh, so that's Saturday, 12 noon Eastern, 5 p.m. UK, and on Monday the 13th, not unlucky for some, actually. It's very lucky for the truth, please. The week today, we've got Karna Bodeman. Karna Bodeman is um, an ex-private secretary, if I'm understanding it correctly, because I've not got a thing on at the moment, um, to Ronald Reagan, um, or at least so close to Ronald Reagan. She worked in the White House. She's wrote, written a book or two, which she wants to concentrate on initially. Um, but, yeah, that's going to be fantastic. So two more awesome guests coming up, Tim. Um, he teaches security um, and private eyes, uh, the guy on Saturday, and then Car Karna Bodeman. Brilliant. Oh, my I keep, God. I keep searching. <laughs> My God, you know, you got a guy that does what I do. Cool. <laughs> I thought <laughs> it might have something in common, but he's got a BS of history. So, loads of roads to go down, yeah? Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds very interesting because uh, he sounds like he's got a similar background. Huh. Okay. No, no, no doubt he's written the book as well. I just that was a quick look at at the schedule that was. Mhm. And I'm on tomorrow night at two p.m. Eastern. Um, and I've I've got a guest as well. And Thursday, <coughs> we're talking about elder abuse. We've talked about child abuse. So, the Families Reunited show on Thursday is elder abuse at two p.m. Eastern again on the same channel must find a way of simultaneous in all these blog talks all the time, but we're having a few techie issues as usual with Windows 8, but we'll get there very shortly and we'll, we'll become the professionals we dreamed of. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Andy. Um, I really enjoyed the... Um, I always enjoy working with you. You know that. It's great. And of course... And of course, we've got we have a lot of gratitude to Bill Zam, um, Kirk, um, and all the new hosts that are coming on. Ria Wilkie, we've got the Paranoid show with Kim, and we've got the um, Never Too Old for Lego with Serena Marine, ten year old from the UK. All coming up very shortly on Freedom Talk Radio dot co dot uk. FreedomSoftRadio.co.uk This is the most diverse, most amazing, one of the funniest radio stations you can ever listen to off the internet. I've heard so much stuff from the ups, the downs, the left, the right, the politics, the non-politics, the smaller politics, whatever you want to call them. It's great. 